Brett McKay here, and welcome to another episode of the Art of Manliness podcast. Now, statistics show that boys are in trouble. They're, they're falling further and further behind in school, and an alarming number of boys are at a high risk for depression, alcohol and drug abuse, violence, and suicide. But what's the cause of these problems, and what can we do to help boys? Well, our guest today has written a book about this topic. His name is Dr. Michael Thompson, and he's the co-author of the book Raising Cain, Protecting the Emotional Life of Boys. Uh, the book was later turned into a PBS documentary by the same, with the same title, which Dr. Thompson wrote and narrated. And Dr. Thompson is a psychologist specializing in children and families. He's the clinical consultant at Belmont High School, an all-boys school in Massachusetts. And in addition to writing about the psychology of boys, Dr. Thompson travels the country speaking and educating audiences about the emotional and psychological needs of boys today. Dr. Thompson, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Brett. Well, Dr. Thompson, what are the emotional problems that boys are facing these days? It's the problems of growing up. It's the problems of feeling good about yourself as a boy and a man in a society which is super focused on school performance where you can't play outdoors because your parents are so frightened of pedophiles. And, and so you don't have the kind of practice being a boy that you've had when there was neighborhood play. I think that's the biggest challenge to boys today is that they don't get to create their own society in the neighborhood and um, their own definition of boyhood. They often feel penned in by school, but they're pounded continuously with the idea that school is so important. And, and finally, uh, there's the problem that boys have always had, which is how to maintain your sensitive uh, inner feelings and look strong on the outside. Hmm. And, and feel strong to yourself. And so you mentioned that 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 school, uh, the way that schools are set up, are kind of a detriment to boys. What about you know this? What about the larger culture? Are there any cultural ideas that kind of have a detrimental effect on boys? Yes, the United States is the most violent society in the industrialized world. Our murder and rape rates are two to twenty to sixty times higher than Western Europe, even though our rates of violence have been going down since 1995 after a, tr a tremendous 20-year run-up. Even though they've been going down in this country, they're still much higher than anywhere else in the industrialized world. And I think it makes people jumpy about boys. I, I think it makes them not trust boy play, be afraid of boys in school. And, and of course, uh, boys who are being raised in high-risk neighborhoods are at risk for seeing violence and being pulled into violence themselves. So that's really how do you be, how do you how can you feel strong in this life without actually ending up violent? Hmm. So what's the solution to you know these emotional you know, inner problems that boys face today? Well, I mean, it's it's simple stuff. It's good parenting. It's having fathers who model self-control, who model uh, studiousness, who model uh, many different ways to be a man. The problem is that 35% of American boys don't have a biological father at home. And they're very dependent on the media to shape what they think of as masculinity. I mean, I, I ask uh, suburban boys with hardworking, busy, preoccupied fathers what, what their image of masculinity is, and they say NFL football players. I mean, that's a little weird, isn't it? because <laughs> these football players aren't absolutely the best models for boys because so few boys have that size and that narrow skill. Most of us are going to have to make it in the world thinking of ourselves as men in some other way. And, and if it's not a, a, an athlete, sometimes it's oftentimes now a celebrity of some sort. Yes, that's right. That's and, right. And you talk in your book a lot about developing the emotional literacy in boys. Can you explain what emotional literacy is? Yeah, it's an ability to identify your feelings and be able uh, to speak about them. Many boys, look, I believe boys have the full range of emotional feelings that girls do. But in boys' society, when you're supposed to look strong, you don't admit to feelings of shame or inadequacy. Or if you admit to it, you admit to it only in a humorous way. But the boy society is different. It shapes a boy's emotional reactions. Think of Think of a fifth grade girl walking into a classroom and saying, oh, I was so upset with my stepmother last night. We fought and fought, and I just went to my room and cried. Okay, the girls are going to gather around her 
and tend her and be sympathetic. What if that had happened to a boy? He'd fought with his stepmother and gone to his room and cried. Is he going to come into school and be able to say that? If he did say that, other boys would back away. Uh oh. <laughs> you know? Yeah. He's a weakling. I, I, that, I can't, I don't want to catch that. So that boys often, they'll come in and curse the stepmother or look tough or threaten revenge or something else, which allows them to think of themselves as manly, but it steers them away from the depth of bad feeling that they had. And it steers them away from a more realistic kind of problem solving. Uh, they can't identify that they how humiliated and helpless they felt. And, and uh, it's helpful to boys to be able to talk about that. But boy society doesn't allow it. So one part of emotional literacy is recognizing the feelings that a boy that a boy might have. You also talk about empathy a lot in the book. Yep. Why is it that boys have a hard time empathizing with other people? I, I don't think we give them practice. I, I think they want to. The Japanese have, you know, five and six year old boys go down and work with two year old children every day in the school. And they they say it's so that the the boys can develop uh, omiyata, which is uh, uh, Japanese for empathy. They think kids need to look after other children in order to develop these feelings. As I say, if you're taking American boys and you're putting them on competitive town soccer teams at five and six, they never have it. You're you're raising them to to be ferocious and competitive, but not empathic. Dr. Thompson, I, a lot of people will hear this and think, okay, that's fine and you know, it's great, we should teach emotional literacy and to boys, but it sounds like we're just turning them to little girls. Um, how would you respond to that? I mean, is it possible to teach emotional literacy while encouraging masculine strength in boys, kind of their innate boyish characteristics? You know, I had a friend who, who was uh, born and raised in Germany and and teaches at Boston University half the year and teaches at this old university in Germany. And he said many American boys would be stunned by how emotionally open German boys are. This is now one of the most pacifistic countries in the world. I mean, the Germans after World War II made a huge, huge effort to redefine what was masculine and to raise German boys differently so they didn't turn out to be so warlike. And he said, you know, um, German boys are so emotionally open that American boys would read them as gay. They're not gay. Um, they're, they're sleeping with girls, but they're talking to them a lot. And that uh, a culture of openness and talking is, is, comes from uh, the notions we have of masculinity. You know, their masculinity varies from culture to culture. What we regard as manly changes from culture to culture. There's a lot about the American de definition of masculinity, which I like. Uh, the independence, uh, the entrepreneurial kind of do it on your own attitude. Uh, there, there are lots of things which I think are very helpful to American men. But uh, the tough, silent definition of masculinity is, of course, for psychologists worrisome because it means boys button down and don't express what they're actually feeling, and then they get out of touch with, with their feelings. Uh, and we're getting a lot of young male depression in late adolescence and early adulthood, and that's worrisome to me. So I try and teach boys that emotional courage is courage. Sharing your feelings requires some guts, you know? It's funny you mentioned about how uh, German men are emotionally open. It seems like there was a time in America that men used to be like this. I mean, if you go back to the 19th century, even before World War II, you would read men, you know, they were very affectionate with each other. You look at photos of men and they would have their arms around each other and sit yes, in each other's right. lap. And, you know, write these very, you know, I, I was reading TR's diary and he, he writes, you know, he has, he, you can tell he was very in touch with his inner self and kind of the, the emotions. What changed? I mean, what happened uh, where we got a, for away from that and into where this manliness and masculinity and kind of the stoic, silent type? Was it World War II that happened that caused this? I, I'm afraid I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I, I think it would take a social historian or a social critic 
uh, to know. But I do think that the definition of masculinity changed from when uh, I'm 62 years old. To when I was a child, there were TV shows with, um, you know, warm-hearted fathers, uh, and including a show called, which I used to watch regularly, called Father Knows Best. <laughs> and somebody uh, did a study of um, TV sitcoms some years ago and found that of 112 fathers on TV shows, there are only about seven of them who are competent. The rest were uh, a boyish, adolescent, irresponsible, nitwit, uh, or irresponsible fathers. I mean, which father... If you were a boy and you were watching two and a half men, which of those two men is a is a man you can admire as a father figure? Yeah, well, I don't think either of them is that that great, but right. I mean, there's a, the ninny, yeah. the real father of the boy, and then there's Charlie Sheen, right? right. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, you know he he's a permanent seventeen for life. And, and why do you why do you think? I mean, just going on that 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 tangent there. I mean, why do you think we put fatherhood out that is kind of, you know, being a dad means kind of being the dumb, overgrown child and just another kid in the family. Why, why do we love that so much in our society? I don't know. It's very painful to me. Yeah. I mean, why do we, you know, why, why did the media grab hold of this attenuated adolescent father? Uh, it's an all the beer commercial. You know, the women are responsible and the men are nitwits. Yeah, it's something I think that's frustrating a lot of men men these days. And, and speaking of, of dads yeah. um, and fathers, what is a, a father's role in teaching emotional literacy to their sons? I mean, what can dads do? I think as a father, you say to your son, you know, I was scared in middle school sometimes. I was worried about bullies. I, I, I wanted to be stronger, but it didn't turn out that way, you know? I turned out to be a writer, uh, uh, an actor, uh, uh, something. We didn't all turn out to be football players. Um, and many of us uh, found our deepest connections with our friends who are boys, meaningful connections. I think fathers should absolutely uh, demonstrate to their sons the power of male friendship, the power of male love for women and respect for women. I mean, they're, they're just, you have to show a boy what a real man is, not the two-dimensional kinds of characters you you see in sports. Uh, one thing that kind of struck me in your book that I thought was interesting uh, was that, you know, yeah. one thing you can do to teach your sons about emotional literacy and is to show your vulnerability sometimes. Right. And you're terrified if your son is weak, you're just uh, terrified that your son will be picked on. <clears throat> But uh, it's better to say uh, uh, what you faced and how you met it with a resilience. So mm -hmm. your son knows mm -hmm. that the most important thing is not to be just strong through everything, but in fact to be resilient, have some balance. So, uh, Dr. Thompson, you work with uh, boys at an all-boys school. What are some things that parents or dads can do to help their sons in school? Because it just seems like... Uh, boys are falling further and further behind. I mean, there's, you can go every month you read an article or see something on the television about how test scores amongst boys are falling down, graduation rates are going down for boys. Right. So, well, we're... it's you know, it's dads who uh, want to send their sons upstairs to do their homework, and they sit downstairs watching, you know, basketball or ice hockey. That won't work. We know that fathers who do their homework with their sons um, get have sons who get higher grades. We know that fathers who attend school PTA meetings and come to things other than town sports have sons who get higher grades. We know that sons um, whose fathers read to them at night do better academically. So I think when you have a little boy, you shouldn't always let the mom read to them. You should go up and read to your son so that he knows being a man is being a reader. Uh, and one thing you talked about in your book, too, is how and we talked a little bit at the beginning of the, the interview about how schools are not really designed the way they are in most public schools, aren't designed with boys in mind. And that's one of the reasons why boys are struggling and teachers struggle with behavioral problems with boys. I mean, what can we do to, 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 to kind of guide our schools uh, in making them more boy, boy friendly? Well, 
in every school I visit, and that's my work as a school consultant, um, there are schools that are gifted, excuse me, there are teachers that are gifted with boys, and there are teachers who are not so good with boys. Um, and I want the, the secrets of teachers who are good with boys to be advertised, that is, highlighted. You know, this is what works with boys in the classroom. There, there's a a Philadelphia psychologist named Michael Reichardt, who's coming out with a book called Reaching Boys, Teaching Boys. And it's based on the best kind of lessons of 600 teachers from boys' schools around the world. And you can actually teach people what are the best kinds of lessons for boys, what, what really works for them. And, and, and that's what I want, because constantly discipline, constantly telling them they're in trouble just makes them pissed off and withdrawn from school. Yeah. Uh, one thing I, I idea that I've heard thrown around by people, particularly with regard to boys in schools, is actually to enroll boys in a school later than you would girls. Is there any Well, truth it's because in, in language acquisition boys on the average boy is behind the average girl in language acquisition. And the average boy is much more um physically restless at age five than the average girl is. So the average boy is, he's up against it in school, which involves a lot of sitting down and listening. So holding them back would kind of put them, uh, I guess, on, on an even playing field with girls? Yeah. And, and Dr. Thompson, as, as I read your book, uh, I was struck that many adult men have the same emotional problems that the teenage boys you write about in your book. Um, what can these men do to overcome these problems that they have? Yes. Well, you know, many, many men find that they get a course in their emotional life by falling in love with a young woman in their 20s. Um, and, and that's great. I think that young men have to go back to their fathers um, rather than just stay angry and away from them. Go back and uh, ask them the, the questions you wish you'd had the answers to when you were 14 and 15. I think men have to talk with each other. I I, you know, I've been a member of a men's group for nine years. That's the kind of thing a psychologist is likely to do. Um, but it's not all mental health professionals. It's mostly educators, actually. And, you know, men can train themselves to be open. I mean, the men in this group were all in their 50s when we started this. And we weren't, a lot of these are very strong and proud men, but we, we trained each other to be open to each other. And that's what I'd like to see. Hmm. And this book, Raising Cain, your book, was written a few years ago. Have you seen any progress since the publication of the book? Um, well, I have to believe that I'm on the road talking about the emotional lives of boys. I, I, I have to hope that it's having an, an impact. Um, but I sure don't see it in the media. <laughs> well, Dr. Thompson, thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure. Nice talking with you, Brett. Thanks. Our guest today was Dr. Michael Thompson. Dr. Thompson is the author of the book Raising Cain, Protecting the Emotional Lives of Boys. And you can pick up Dr. Thompson's book at Amazon.com or any other major bookseller. Well, that wraps up another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. For more manly tips and advice, make sure to check out the Art of Manliness website at artofmanliness.com. And until next time, stay manly.